Hey everyone, welcome back to Informed Mommies. Today I'm going to be taking you through my entire experience with labor and delivery. I'm going to be honest and direct about the entire process because if you're here for advice, the last thing you need is someone lying to you about how easy it was. So without further ado, here is my story. I was lucky enough to have my entire pregnancy go smoothly. That is, right up until the end. Two days after my due date, I wasn't feeling that great. I had some nausea and some dizzy spells accompanied by a headache. My husband was concerned and told me that he would work from home the rest of the day if I wanted, since I had a doctor's appointment later that day. But after I ate lunch, I was feeling a lot better. I even took a walk outside in the afternoon before getting ready to leave for the doctor's visit. I went into the office for my 40-week checkup, and they told me that my blood pressure was a little higher than they would have wanted it. I mentioned that I hadn't been feeling very well, and then I had my normal visit. We scheduled an induction for the following week if she hadn't made an appearance by then, and then the doctor asked for my blood pressure to be checked again before I leave. When she saw that it was still higher than she wanted it, she said I needed to go to the hospital labor and delivery ward to be checked out and monitored for a little while. She said that if I didn't manage to get my blood pressure under control within a few hours, I'd be getting induced that night. I left, feeling really anxious, and texted my husband to leave work and come meet me at home. We grabbed our hospital bags just in case and drove to the hospital. We got there, I filled out the paperwork to be admitted, and we went to triage, where the nurses had me get into a gown and connected me to the fetal heart rate monitor. I have to admit, I was very anxious and stressed out. I mean, who wouldn't be? I could hear other women in labor moaning or shouting out, and I was worried about my blood pressure. About two hours later, the nurse came to tell me that my blood pressure was not improving and that they were moving us to a labor and delivery room to start the induction process. I asked the nurses if my husband should get our bags from the car, but she said once we were all settled, he could go get them. I mentioned that I hadn't eaten any dinner since we had kind of rushed to get there and we hadn't had the chance to eat. The nurse told me that unfortunately the kitchen was already closed for the night, but that she could get me some peanut butter and crackers because once they started the induction process, I would no longer be allowed to eat anything solid. The nurse put in my IV and hung the saline bag, put a heart rate monitor on my finger and a blood pressure cuff on my arm. The cuff took my blood pressure every 15 minutes. Every so often, the blood pressure machine would sound an alarm. It freaked me and my husband out the first time it happened, and after about five minutes of this alarm going off that we didn't know what it meant, with no response from any of the nurses, we paged them. All they said to my husband was, oh, here's how to turn off the alarm, we're monitoring her blood pressure from the nurse's station. So a woman in labor who is being induced due to high blood pressure, you're just going to leave alone? Because that makes sense, right? Around 8.15 p.m., I got my first dose of Cytotec, which is a cervix softening drug. I was only dilated to about half a centimeter at that point, and they said that I wasn't fully effaced, which is why they were giving me this. They told me that I might feel some contractions, but that wasn't really the point of this drug, and I wouldn't be getting the Pitocin just yet. We got settled into our room. My husband went to go get our bags, and I changed into my own labor and delivery gown, which was a lot more comfortable than the paper one. We turned on the TV, we tried to nap a little, and then the doctor came back to administer my second dose of Cytotec. A few hours after that second dose, they started me on Pitocin. Pitocin is a drug that is used to cause contractions, but it can also cause stronger contractions than natural birth. After a while, I asked the nurse for a yoga ball to sit on. She brought one over and put a blanket down and helped me bring my IV stand over to it and get comfortable. Even though it was helping me, the fetal heart rate monitor kept moving and the nurses had to keep coming in to readjust it to find her heartbeat. Then around three in the morning, the nurse came in to tell me that my blood pressure was spiking too high and that they were going to start me on a magnesium drip. The magnesium, or mag, is used in severe cases of preeclampsia to prevent seizures from happening. Now keep in mind that no one yet has told me that I had preeclampsia. I actually only knew that the mag was used for preeclampsia because a friend of mine developed postpartum preeclampsia and was also put on mag after she had had her baby a few months prior. This would also mean that I would be confined to bed for the remainder of my labor and then for 24 hours following birth. I was able to get to the bathroom before it started, but afterwards I had to use either the bedpan or have a catheter. Fun. The mag can also make you feel weak, slow your labor, and cause the baby to be very lethargic at birth. A lot of the time between the big events is honestly pretty much a blur. 
I don't know if it was from the medicine or the exhaustion from lack of sleep or just my mind condensing such a traumatic time, but I do know that the Pitocin dose was increased quite a few times because I wasn't really progressing the way the doctors wanted me to. And I do remember getting breakfast as soon as the kitchen was open. My husband got pancakes, which came with fruit, which he didn't really like, so he barely ate. And I got broth, jello, juice, and an Italian ice. I guess I can't really complain because even though it wasn't very substantial, I've heard stories where women weren't allowed to have anything at all during labor. So at least I got to have something. Around maybe eight in the morning, the doctor told me that I was only about two centimeters dilated, which was very frustrating to hear after all of that time. And then she said she wanted to do a Foley balloon catheter. The Foley balloon is a catheter that is inserted into the birth canal and then blown up, which puts pressure on the cervix and helps it dilate. Then every few hours or so, the nurse would come in and tug on it a little bit so it would continue to put pressure in a downward motion. We agreed that this was the best course of action and they did the procedure by inserting and inflating the balloon. We tried to rest a little bit more with very little success. Around 11, we ordered our lunch to be sent up. By this point, we were about 15 hours into our labor and I was starting to get pretty uncomfortable. The contractions were getting more intense to where I had to stop what I was doing and I couldn't really focus on anything. My husband tried to distract me with videos on YouTube that I like and music from my Bluetooth speaker and the playlist that I had made, but the music just made me really sad. I had specifically designed this playlist so that I could sway or dance or move through the pain and being stuck in bed could not do so. My body was also really starting to hurt from just laying there. At that point, I thought I was registering my pain at a seven on a scale from one to 10 or unmanageable. I was in pain almost all the time. I just wanted to be doing something else like sleeping or watching TV. I told my husband I thought it was time for an epidural. I hadn't really wanted one, but circumstances change. I was in pain. I was unable to cope with my pain in any of the methods that I was hoping to, and I just couldn't deal with it just laying there. He said he supported me in my decision, and if that's what I thought that I needed, then that was that. We called the nurse in to tell her, and she left to go get the anesthesiologist. I definitely cried about it because I was scared of the epi and because I felt like I had failed myself. The minute it got too hard, I gave up, but my husband was there to hold my hand and support me. He said there was no shame in asking for help, and at the very least, maybe the epi would allow me to get some much-needed sleep. The anesthesiologist showed up, of course, just after our food got there. He explained what he was about to do, made me sign waivers and forms, and then had me sit at the edge of the bed and lean forward so that my spine was rounded towards him. Thankfully, my husband was allowed to stay with me while it was being done. I was terrified, and I jumped when he tried to prick me with the needle. He berated me harshly for moving when he had told me to be still, and roughly shoved my head back down towards my chest and told me not to move. I am terrible with needles, so I clutched onto my husband as tightly as I could, and he was trying to quietly talk me through the pain. The needle went in, and I cried out, but that wasn't the worst part. After that came the catheter, which delivers the medicine. I could feel him shoving the catheter down my spinal cord, which was probably the worst thing I've ever felt in my life. The worst pain in my entire life. Worse than the labor that I was feeling at that time. I was screaming out and sobbing profusely. It was excruciating, and my husband was devastated to see me in such a way because he couldn't do anything to help, so he was in tears as well. Afterwards, the anesthesiologist told me that I was the biggest wimp he'd ever had. Great bedside manners, dude. Then he told me that I couldn't sit up past a 30 to 45 degree angle unless I wanted all of the medicine to go straight to my butt and still feel all of the pain of labor. After the epi, I was given a catheter, since I wouldn't be able to feel when I had the need to go to the bathroom and would be even more unable to lift my body to use the bedpan. The nurse came in to help me position my legs on a peanut bowl, and thankfully I was able to get some sleep. However, I did experience shaking fits throughout the remainder of my labor, and even for a few hours after delivery. The nurses said it was from all the hormones but they weren't happening before I got the epidural, so I think it was from the drugs. My legs were totally dead weight. I couldn't feel them at all, and moving them was insanely hard. When I touched it with my hands, I said to my husband that it felt like ham hocks. Every so often, the nurse would come in, tug on the Foley, and help me reposition from one side to the other on the peanut ball. At one point around 6 p.m., I think, when she tugged on the Foley, it actually came out which means that at 
approximately 22 hours of labor, I was six centimeters dilated. The shaking fits were still coming and going. The nurse brought me a heavier blanket to see if it would help, but they weren't caused by cold. My Pitocin dose was increased again, and I had to be given another bag of the epidural drugs since mine was running out. After it was changed, I started to notice that one leg felt more numb than the other, and I was starting to feel pain in my groin and lower abdomen on that side as well. The nurses chalked it up to my position and helped me reposition to the other side, which just made it worse. Despite their efforts, no matter what I did, the pain was still there. My husband and I had our third meal of the day. More broth, juice, jello, and ice for me. He had to help me since I couldn't sit up high enough to spoon broth into my mouth. I had to drink my juice and broth from a straw laying down. The ice and the jello were just solid enough that I could eat them with a spoon in my semi-reclined position. Then we settled in to watch more YouTube since we weren't sure how long it would be from that point. We heard a woman come into the room behind us. There was a tiny gap between the wall and the window where we could kind of hear what was going on from the next room. It sounded like she was a lot further along than me since we could hear a hustle and bustle in there and lots of doctors and nurses coming and going. And I told my husband, if she gives birth before me, I'm going to lose my mind because she would be the second person in and out of that room before we had left. Sure enough, a short while later, we heard screaming and crying and everyone laughing and congratulating her. I started crying again because I was just so frustrated at this point. Then I felt something, a big gushing. I think this was maybe 8, 8.30 p.m., somewhere along those lines. I paged the nurse and I told her, I think my water broke. She checked and said, yep, your water broke, all right. She said she thought I was maybe eight and a half centimeters or so, but that she was going to go tell the doctor that my water had broken and the doctor would probably come do another check on me fairly soon. I was getting really nauseous too, so I told the nurse I wasn't feeling well. She handed me a ring with a blue garbage bag coming out of it which kind of looks like a diaper genie refill if you've ever seen one. And I did actually end up using it. My husband, bless him, helped me hold it. And when the nurse came back, he asked, what should I do with this? We expected her to take it and do whatever she needs to do with it. But she told him to dump it into the toilet. She made him do it. Like, what? Anyway, the doctor comes in and this is right around 9 p.m. And she tells me that it's time to start pushing, that I'm at 10 centimeters. They put my legs up in the stirrups and of course... My contractions slow down. She kept asking me if I felt like I needed to push, but I still couldn't feel anything at all. So I was just guessing at that point. She kept telling me to hold my breath for 10 seconds while I was pushing, but that didn't feel right for me. So every time that I would let go of my breath, she would stop the count and make me start again. I wanted to groan or moan or let out my air as I pushed because that felt more natural to me. And I was having trouble staying in the position that they wanted me in. I just kept telling her, I don't feel like I'm doing anything. And she just kept saying, well, just push harder. I don't know what that means. I felt like I was tiring myself out to accomplish nothing. I've heard stories of women pushing for three, four, even five hours, and there was no way that I could keep up this. Here's where I'm going to get blunt and probably a little gross. Ladies, you will probably poop while you're pushing. I know I did. A lot of women won't even realize it because the doctors and nurses aren't going to say that you did and they'll probably just clean it up without you even noticing. If you're numb and in the zone, you might not even feel it. I did, but I know other people who didn't know and didn't want to know. Then the doctor tells me that she can see the baby has a lot of hair. It didn't even register to me when she said that, that the baby was probably crowning. All I could think of was, what does that have to do with anything? All I could feel was this intense pressure. The doctor was berating me some more for not holding my breath, but I started just ignoring her and just doing my own thing anyway. I definitely yelled a lot. And my husband told me later that he knew when I went from a pained moaning yell to a scary guttural scream that it would be my last push. I pushed and screamed and I felt a release of pressure mostly, but also all of the amniotic fluid and the blood and everything that comes out after the baby. <laughs> That was 10 p.m. on Saturday, 26 hours after my induction had been started. And after that, I saw her for the first time. I thought I would cry, but I didn't. I was just too in awe. They had NICU doctors on standby, since the mag can make babies so lethargic at birth. But as soon as she came out, she started screaming that wonderful just-born scream, and the NICU doctor said, I don't think I really need to be here. They lay my daughter on a blanket on my chest, and we were immediately in love. I don't even remember delivering the afterbirth. 
I'm sure I must have because it would have been a real problem if I hadn't. My doctor told me that I surprisingly only had one small tear and it only needed one stitch. Because I still had the epi, I didn't feel a thing when she stitched me. Now normally this would be the end. In a normal birth story, you deliver, everything's good, and two hours later you are moved to the maternity ward to start your healing. But I had to stay on the mag for another 24 hours before I could be moved to the maternity ward. They did bring in a more comfortable bed once the epidural had worn off and I was able to shimmy from one bed to the other, which was a process, let me tell you. My husband had to do every single diaper change in that first 24 hours since I couldn't get out of bed. We struggled with breastfeeding and we struggled with sleeping. My O2 sensor would blare an alarm if it dropped below 94%, even for a second, and that alarm would wake up the baby. At one point, I actually slept through her screaming for about 40 minutes as my husband tried everything he could to soothe her with no luck. I had night terrors where I was bombarded by lights and sounds and my heart racing and I'd wake up gasping for air. We finally just sent her to the nursery for a few hours so that he could get some sleep. The 24 hours came and went, and then finally I was taken off the mag. It was actually closer to 26 hours at that point. Then I had to wait another two hours as it worked its way out of my system before I could get out of bed. Around 3 a.m. on Monday morning, the nurse came in. I was so weak it took two nurses to get me to the bathroom. I had been in bed for so long and had been on medication that made me feel weak and numb and my back was so sore from the epidural. They helped me out of bed, and they showed me how to arrange the giant pad and mesh undies, how to clean myself with a peri bottle, and how to spray dermaplast on that area to keep it numb and help with the pain. They also have these giant cool packs that you can use, but I chose not to. My husband was sleeping, and he slept through the whole thing. I woke him when we were ready to move rooms, and he gathered our bags as the nurses helped me into my wheelchair. After that, we went to the maternity ward, where we were barely checked on. There were no machines beeping and humming. I was finally able to have my IV taken out, I think on Tuesday, which is when I was able to shower for the first time. I had been given a sponge bath when I was in the labor and delivery room confined to bed, but really it was just me with a washcloth wiping my face and my body and using some dry shampoo. We were finally discharged at 6 p.m. on Wednesday after four whole days in the hospital. We were finally on our way home. My husband brought the car around to the front door and brought the car seat up while I got the baby dressed in her going home outfit. Then the nurses got me into my wheelchair and helped me pack up all of the postpartum care goodies I had asked for. And then they brought us down to the door. Well, that's the whole story. I hope I didn't scare you off. And if you stuck through this incredibly long story, thank you so much for listening to my journey. Please come join me next time as I talk about my experience as a new first-time mom during a pandemic. And remember that if you want to stay updated on new content, to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Bye!